Welcome to the Angus Report. I'm your host, Clint Mefford. Join us this week for the most comprehensive cattle news and education. This month, we'll be focusing on cattle care and handling, part of the association's belief statement, Raising Standards. We'll hear from association CEO, Alamitcha Gimba, about its importance. We visit with a beef quality assurance expert on the program, and we learn about Angus Genetics' new research EPD for pulmonary arterial pressure. This is the Angus Report. Beef Quality Assurance, or BQA, is a producer-driven program that assures management, husbandry, and animal health practices meet regulatory and industry standards. In addition to record keeping and best practices, BQA helps reflect a positive public image and instills consumer confidence in the beef industry. This is important now more than ever because of the increased public attention on animal welfare. The Beef Quality Assurance Program is really a total cattle management program that covers everything from calving all the way to ensuring a high quality, safe, and wholesome beef supply to the consumer. So really, um, we're looking at all of those live cattle production practices that can influence the, first of all, quality of beef, um, but also subsequently the safety of beef. Um, so the, the Beef Quality Assurance Program is a set of guidelines, best practices, that beef producers can implement on their operations uh, to do their part in supplying a safe and wholesome beef supply to consumers, while also increasing that consumer confidence uh, because we are able to assure that, that wholesome quality product. Back when BQA was started, we had some issues with quality defects that were uh, coming from live cattle production practices, uh, mainly the uh, injection site lesions and where injections were given. Um, Many of our producers know that injections uh, traditionally were given uh, in the rear of the animal in the rump, and today we've moved that site uh, up to the neck. And over the last 30 years, we've had tremendous progress uh, to seeing injection site lesions reduced to next to nothing um, because we're aware of where those may be, and we've also uh, gained ground with our producers on making those subcutaneous injections. So that was the first step um, in the Beef Quality Assurance Program, but today it encompasses Encompasses such a wide range of topics um, uh, of on the farm practices that can improve uh, the quality of beef that we serve. So the ultimate goal um, is to ensure that what we're doing on the farm, how we're raising those animals, uh, ensures a quality product for consumers. So the National Beef Quality Audit is really the measuring stick for the BQA program. Uh, every five years we assess um, the fed cattle uh, sector of our industry and about every 10 years we assess um, the market cow and bull sector of our industry to measure the progress that we're making in regards to the quality of beef um, as well as the safety of beef and then also some animal welfare components uh, on these animals as they arrive at slaughter. And so the most recent audit was completed in 2016 uh, and those results were made available um, in 2017 and we saw tremendous growth um, in our industry in regards to uh, grading and quality. We saw a huge increase in uh, quality amongst uh, the fed sector of our industry, but also in some of our key uh, animal welfare measures, things like um, sound animals arriving to the plant, um, locomotion scores, um, and also uh, the condition that the animals were arriving. So we saw a lot of progress there, obviously still some progress to make. Uh, one of the key findings of that was that while um, the significance of bruises decreased, uh, we saw an increase in the number of bruises. So the industry is uh, researching that, taking a look at what might be causing that. Um, and as a result of the, the 2016 National Beef Quality Audit, BQA uh, began the BQA transportation program. Uh, many of our industry professionals and uh, researchers believe that some of that bruising was coming from the transportation sector and when we were hauling cattle. Um, and so we're looking at industry best practices and implementing those uh, within the transportation sector of cattle production. Consumers are ever more uh, interested in how their beef is raised and how all of their food is really produced. And so the BQA program is able to answer a lot of those consumer questions. We're able to go to consumers and share the responsible story about how producers are implementing best practices on their operations and responsibly raising beef. Our producers have been doing uh, the right thing for years and years, and in many cases, uh, BQA is just a proof point that, that they've been doing the right thing um, all along. And, and because the program 
uh, has been around for so long. Uh, so many of our best practices around BQA are just industry standard at this point, and people practice them each and every day. Um, so uh, I think our producers are committed to doing the right thing. Um, and, and just like our slogan for BQA is the right way is the only way, I think for so many of our beef cattle operations across the country, that's been their slogan since the very beginning. Stay with us, more Angus Report after a break. Welcome back to the Angus Report. Cattle care, next generation, community, and environment are the four pillars that the American Angus Association's belief statement, Raising Standards, is built upon. Alan Michigimba, the association's CEO, elaborates on this month's theme pillar, cattle care. At the convention last year in Columbus, I talked about, introduced this concept of our belief statement of raising standards, and that's what this association has done for generations, quite frankly. We've raised standards for the entire beef industry, and that's what we want to continue to do. We want to highlight that, we want to celebrate it, but most importantly, we want to lead. It's really important for organizations to, to set a foundation, if you will, for what they believe in and what they represent as they go about doing business. It's no different from the American Ang Association. So we've got four pillars that are very important to us that we use as our foundation for our messaging. One would be cattle care, one would be the next generation, one would be community, our local communities, and the fourth would be the environment and the great job our members do of protecting the environment. And that literally sets the, the foundation for all our messaging. So the four pillars were chosen. It was a collective effort uh, led by the team uh, at Certified Angus Beef and, and the communications team here at the American Angus Association. They worked together to identify those four key pillars, and that was based on a lot of research and so forth. But we know those pillars literally are, are what sustain this industry, right? So we're, we're talking about first and foremost when it comes to our producer's perspective, cattle care and, and proper cattle care and handling. You think about the next generation. We all do this for the next generation. Think about our local communities and how important they are to us and, and how this breed has helped support them by the success of our members. And last but certainly not, not least, the environment's our fourth pillar. We all know how important the environment is to us. And that's why we, why, why we do such a great job with it, to make sure that the environment's going to be around for this next generation of Angus producers, right? So when you think about the four key pillars, again, again, it's cattle care and handling, the environment, community, and the next generation. It's just a great story because it's, it's what we do and it's who we are. We all know how important it is to treat cattle properly and to handle them properly, and everybody in this industry knows that. And our members do a great job with that, so we want to we want to show folks that we do that, and we're proud of how the cattle we raise and how we go about raising them. And that's why we're going to have this theme this month, to, to let people know and let people outside the industry know the American Angus Association is second to none when it comes to cattle care. We check in now on the latest cattle market news with the Cattle Facts Update. Hello, I'm Marcus Bricks with the Cattle Facts Update. Due to the partial government shutdown at the start of 2019, many USDA reports and publications were put on hold. Slowly after employees returned to work, offices like the Economic Research Service began work to cover missing data from the shutdown. One of these many reports was the Meat Price Spreads dataset, containing a glimpse into the retail price relationships between the major proteins, beef, pork, and poultry. Since the January report was not released initially, the February data release completes the 2018 price series. The average USDA all-fresh retail beef price was reported at $5.59 per pound, about five cents lower than a year ago. Beef retail demand weakened in the back half of 2018, with fourth quarter demand averaging 3% below a year ago. January 2019, retail beef prices were 17 cents or 3% above a year ago, averaging $5.73 per pound. Since January per capita beef supplies are estimated to be near even with 2018, the price increase relates to a 1% year-over-year demand increase. While only a modest growth number, the result is more optimistic coming off of the weak fourth quarter numbers, especially a December with demand down 6%. Relative to a year ago, retail pork prices were down 1% in January, and retail broiler prices were up 2%, despite breast prices holding flat. Keep in mind, retail beef prices today are already 1.5 times the price per pound of pork, and beef prices are three times the cost of buying chicken. Price spreads between beef and the competing proteins have been historically elevated since 2015, but have been on a steady increase since the beef demand lows in 1998. Only two events have broken the long-term uptrend in beef price spreads, 
the recessions in 2001 and 2007. Shoppers have grown more accustomed to paying a price premium to buy beef over pork and poultry since 2015, but that willingness to pay shrinks as disposable incomes fall. With economic indicators showing increasing risk of recession within the next two years, cattle producers should recognize the potential for demand loss. The cattle producers' share of the dollars being spent on beef at retail is already expected to be the lowest on record. This is not a comfortable margin environment for cattle producers today, and a recession would make the fight for leverage even more difficult. For the Angus Report and Cattle Facts, I'm Marcus Briggs. To learn more about Cattle Facts, your leading source for beef industry market information, visit cattlefacts.com. Next on the Angus Report, we hear from experts on PAP. Stay tuned. Pulmonary arterial pressure, or PAP, has been receiving more attention as high elevation producers look to source genetics that are less susceptible to high altitude disease. As the only vet school in the Rocky Mountain region, Colorado State University is the hub for PAP education. And in turn, Dr. Tim Holt, a veterinarian and associate professor at CSU, has become the point man for PAP testing. It wasn't until 1979, 1980 when PAP testing really started to become of interest because it had all started back in a little town called Hesperus, Colorado at about 8,200 feet. And what that is, is there was a Four Corners bull test there. So people all over the United States were bringing bulls to Hesperus and they were finding out after one to two weeks there, many of the bulls were falling over dead. And when they started exploring that, they go, isn't this amazing that the bulls from Durango and Hesperus and high elevation were fine, but the bulls from Oklahoma, Wisconsin, California all had perished. And so <clears throat> we started looking into that. And sure enough, we had human cardiologists there, human pulmonologists there, and really decided that this was a case of cardiac disease. So back in 1979, 1980, we started trying to come up with this thing called PAP testing or pulmonary arterial testing, and that maybe there was a way that we could predict which animals had pulmonary hypertension and actually save their lives by predicting that and then getting them out of there. Cattle are ideally tested after spending three weeks at a higher elevation. Holt described the testing process and the scoring system for PAP. I'm going to get a mean score, which means, and mean, we always think it's systolic over diastolic. It's, it's a lot more complicated by, than that, but that's what we look at. So we look at the mean score, and that number that, that's right there <clears throat> tells me how much vasoconstriction has been going on, if the animal has hypertension or not. And then the other scores that I use are systolic over diastolic. When I look at those numbers, it tells me what the cardiac function is, how healthy this heart is, how healthy the lung tissue is, is my catheter in the right spot or not. So I take those three numbers. For instance, if I get a number of 51, 60 over 20, that's all very, very accurate. And I know that I was in the right spot. I know the animal is in good health. I know there wasn't any kind of respiratory disease going on. Or if I get a 41 and I get 109 over minus four, I know that animal is throwing a fit in the chute. And I know that he has the ability to do this thing called vascular recruitment. So it's not just cut and dry numbers. There's a lot to it besides that. But that's why I take those numbers and I evaluate what I think the future success of that bull is. So a good score would be, a mean score would be 41 and under. A moderate score would be 42 to 48, somewhere in that area. And then a high score, virtually you can classify high scores as 50 and above. And I get, I get bulls papping in the hundreds all the time, all the time and 70s and 80s. So they're extremely hypertensive and they're walking on that thin ice of death. Uh, those animals often will be walking in pulmonary aneurysm and fall over dead. So why can't we predict that and get them out and let them live? Angus Genetics Inc. recently launched a research PAP EPD in collaboration with the American Angus Association and Colorado State University. Mark Enns, another professor of animal science at CSU, explains the significance of a PAP EPD for high elevation producers. We've uh, looked at the data from a number of different ways. Uh, the trait is very heritable, which we knew from other research reports and, and some of the work at CSU originally. Uh, I think it was uh, around 30% heritable, the trait, at uh, high elevation above 5,250 feet. And that's really in line with the heritability of weaning weight and yearling weight, which says we have a lot of room or a lot of genetic variability to work with to make genetic improvement. 
we've changed cattle. If you look at the cattle we used to have in the 70s to the cattle we have now, they're, they're different. Even within a breed, we've made a lot of genetic improvement and changes in the animal. Two, we have an industry now on the seed stock side you know, that historically you may buy seed stock bulls from somebody else at high elevation in Colorado and bring those in and that's how you swap genetics. We have such a growing use of AI in a lot of our seed stock industries where we're trying to source the best genetics for a certain set of traits and that may come from Georgia or Iowa. We bring those in and we find, wait a minute, those animals don't make it here. And so that's why I think there's a, there's a burgeoning interest or growing interest in, in pulmonary arterial pressure because we have such a great exchange of germplasm amongst breeders from all over the country, Canada, and sometimes worldwide. It's an important step for anybody who's producing cattle above 5,000 feet uh, because it should, the, the appropriate use of that should improve the calf survival and uh, uh, improve their overall profitability. Uh, but looking forward, we're starting to see incidences of heart failure in feedlots at below 5,000 feet. We don't quite understand why this is occurring because we don't have the lack of oxygen at those elevations that we do at high elevation. And so there's been a lot of speculation as to why that's occurring, but we're starting to see a lot more feedlot death that is associated with heart failure than we used to see. And so we want to know if we can leverage this. Our next stage of our research is can we leverage the, the PAP information that Angus breeders and, and other breeders have collected to tell us something about what's hap starting to happen in the feedlot. And if we can leverage that information, we can start to select animals that have a higher survival rate in the feedlot, or that's our hope. Up next, we learn more about the American Angus Association's new research PAP EPD. We'll be right back. Welcome back. The Research PAP EPD from AGI is the first of its kind for any breed association. The EPD intends to prompt discussion among high altitude breeders to gather feedback from the industry before a weekly production PAP EPD would be released later this year. The 1st of February we released a, a research EPD, uh, a public uh, list of bulls with accuracy of 0.4 or above uh, based on the genetic evaluation using the data that Angus breeders have submitted. Uh, we expect to get another uh, set of data from Colorado State University from their, some of their research herds to add to that. Uh, and hopefully uh, before uh, you know, the end of the year, uh, we hope to include PAP in the weekly genetic evaluation so more cattle uh, will have PAP EPDs. So the PAP EPD, uh, the research EPD, and, and what will ultimately become a weekly production EPD is genomically enhanced, uh, just like all the EPDs that, that Angus provides. So we use the same single step algorithm uh, that basically builds a genomic pedigree for these cattle and so uh, cattle that are genomically tested that information is incorporated in the PAP EPD. There are not any specific markers identified yet that, that, that uh, look at PAP alone so it's, it's no different than the way we evaluate growth or calving ease uh, that we use all the markers uh, from Angus GS or HD50K tests uh, to develop uh, relationships among animals and add accuracy to the EPD. One of the, the uh, sort of the research questions that, that has been part of the study with CSU is understanding uh, the impact of higher or, or more moderate elevation on PAP test results. We know that as cattle uh, uh, are, go higher and higher in the mountains that uh, the PAP uh, test results become more extreme. And so, uh, but yet we also have learned from this research that cattle that are, that are tested at a, at a moderate elevation, uh, say 4,500 feet, uh, they still rank the sires very similarly. Uh, a 4,500 foot PAP is not a guarantee that a bull can, can go to 9,000 feet and, and do well there. Uh, but in terms of looking how sires rank at those moderate elevation uh, contemporary groups, the bulls rank very similarly. So when there are producers that are measuring cattle at that altitude, we can use that database in the evaluation as well. We would encourage any Angus breeders that are collecting PAP data to submit that to the association, to the database for the genetic evaluation. Uh, that they can log in to, to their account on AAA login and uh, under data submission there's a place to uh, basically create a spreadsheet so you can uh, create an animal set of animals that have been tested or going to be tested. It'll pre-populate the birth dates, the registration numbers, all that sort of thing. All you have to do is put in the, the PAP test result, the date of the test and the elevation at which it was taken uh, and then uh, you basically email that spreadsheet up to the association we added in. And any breeder that submits data for the PAP evaluation will receive then a, a EPDs on all the animals from their herd that we can calculate on. So 
Uh, if you submit uh, PAP test results on your bulls, those bulls will provide PAP EPDs on those and will also, uh, for example, calculate the EPDs on their dams. As the exchange of genetics continues to grow, high altitude producers are excited for a PAP EPD and the significance it will have on selection decisions. We have been working with uh, American Angus and CSU for several years to get this dialogue started. Uh, we had a meeting last year um, around this time at, with an initial meeting with um, AGI to talk about what PAP is going to mean and how the EPD will get calculated. There's a lot of variability in this. There's a lot of environmental in, uh, influence and there's a lot at stake um, depending on how that data is used. So uh, since we do PAP and we do select sires um, uh, and have to figure out how they are going to do an elevation with um, AI, it's a really important EPD that's going to make a big difference in our business as well as to our buyers. Because we are at elevation, again, seven to 8,000 feet and sometimes higher depending on where our lease ground is, um, PAP is, a, is something that we do see. Um, we sell bulls to uh, other mountain ranches, mostly commercial people. Um, and you hear from them, they have um, problems sometimes with high elevation disease, and they start to wonder, wonder what they can do to, to mitigate it against that. And so they start researching, and PAP, is, as I said, has become more and more of a topic of conversation. So um, we select sires based on what we think will, they will do uh, genetically at PAP. We have to take a risk sometimes with new AI sires. We PAP test our calves um, when they're weanlings and then again when they're yearlings to get valid scores. And then we can then talk intelligently to our buyers about what they're getting with the bulls that they're buying from us. If breeders have PAP data above 5,000 feet, they should absolutely send that data in. The more data, as you know, is the better the EPD will get um, in terms of accuracy and, and reliability of the, um, of the information. So um, I think it's early days. I know we've worked hard with American Angus to get buy-in on people submitting their data with um, the other breeders to turn that in. Uh, with Together with CSU, we have a permission letter, for example, that if any of the vets from CSU do the PAP scores, um, mostly Dr. Holt. Um, you can sign that letter and he will then turn that data in on your behalf. It's on the right track and because so much is at stake again because of the implications of if you pick an animal that won't do well at elevation and then you use that and propagate your, your, your herd with that and it doesn't do well, you know, the financial risks are huge. So. Um, it's, a, it's a necessary tool, and I'm glad, again, that we have a lot more buy-in into how serious this is and how important it is. We're really excited for Angus breeders to have yet another tool to add to their genetic toolbox. And that's a wrap for this week's Angus Report. Tune in next week for industry-leading news and education, and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Angus TV, for more highlights from the association. We'll see you next week.